well, I guess he's not coming. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up with lesson five. All right. So we left off um, on lesson four with um, space and shape and form. And now we're going to round out with our last couple of um, elements of design, which are value, color, and texture. So value is the lightness or darkness of a tone or a color. Um, everything, I, I feel like light is maybe one of the most important elements because everything we see is made visible by light. So light will change the the nature of pretty much everything that we encounter in our day-to-day -day life. Um, if we were just imagine, you know, you're in whatever room you are in right now and there's no windows, there's no like technology that has light to it. Um, there's no lights coming in from anywhere. It's just a totally pitch black, dark room. Um, you you wouldn't have any like understanding of any of the objects that were previously made illuminated by the light. Um, so like one like little you know pin prick into the wall um, that would allow some light in would immediately be begin to inform the space around you. But without that light in there, we don't have an understanding of what is, what line is, what shape is, what space is, what um, color is, what texture is, any of those things. Um, Light can be directed, reflected, refracted, diffracted, or diffused. And the um, source, color, intensity, and direction of light greatly affect the way things appear. So this is an example I have right here. This is probably a familiar sculpture to you. It's just the Abe Lincoln statue um, in DC. And the only difference between these two pieces right here is that in the left piece, the light is coming from above or from below. So we have like a light source or a flashlight or something. Um, being illuminated from the bottom half. And then on the top, um, or on the right side, the light's coming from above. So it totally changes the expression um, and just like the visual imagery of this statue entirely, just depending on where the light is coming from. <clears throat> um, we have value scales. Um, value scales are typically measured on a one to 10 scale as seen, um, one being the lightest and 10 being the darkest. And then we also have our categories of light as well. There are six categories of light that we understand. Um, we have our highlight, which this is our object that we're using to apply the six categories of light. Our highlight is like a one. It's like the lightest point. And it's, it's where the light source is the closest to the object. So um, when you're looking at this example right here, Imagine there's a light source coming from the right side of the page right here because it the highlight is on the right side of the object. So we know the light source has to be coming from the right. It's not coming from the left side because the left side is darker. So the highlight is like a one or a two on the one to 10 value scale. A midtone is the natural value of an object. So like that's like not under any light circumstances. It's just like overhead natural light. And then a shadow is usually like a four or five, um, and the midtone is usually like a three or a four. Um, shadow is usually like a four or a five, and it's just when the object starts to get a little bit darker. So we see that happening sort of right in there. A core shadow, that's like the darkest shadow that's on the object. So we see that happening in this sort of like curvy line that occurs right there. And it jumps up to like a six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. Our reflected light, usually in an object, there's like a little bounce of light that happens that like bumps up from like the table at the surface of where the object is at. And so it goes back to like a, I don't know, four or three, somewhere in there. Uh, and then lastly, our cast shadow. Our cast shadow tends to be the darkest shadow, especially right underneath the object there. And it jumps to like a nine or a 10 sometimes. But that's essentially the the cast shadow is the shadow that is created from the object, like the shadow of the object. And it's always on the, the opposite side of where the highlight is at. But we can see a good example of that here. And we can also see how the light moves from being the lightest where the light source is coming from and then the darkest where it's farthest away from. Okay. Another theory within, um, or a part of art theory within light is implied light or chiaroscuro. Um, implied light is when there is a dark room with only one light source. So for example, we have that here. 
there's a clear light source coming from sort of the front left of this image here, and that's illuminating this whole piece. Churrascuro translates to meaning churro, which is light, and oscuro, which means dark, so needing light and dark to understand an image. Um, and it creates the illusion that the figures have a roundness and a bulk to them by creating this very dynamic light. Okay, our next element is color. Color is the property possessed by an object of producing different sensations of the eye as a result of the way the object reflects or emits light. And that's just our quick Google definition. This is not a quiz question, so um, I don't, you don't need to write down this whole definition, but that's just Google's answer to what color is. So color, um, it can affect our mood directly and modify our thoughts and actions as well, and even our health sometimes. Um, we can express ourselves through the use of color um, based on how we're feeling or, you know, what kind of um, aesthetic we're wanting to have or anything like that. And certain cultures follow established customs of colors. Um, going off of the culture thing, um, traditionally, especially when we get into our, our art history, you'll see that there are certain countries and there are certain parts of the world that are exclusively use certain colors. And that's because traditionally color is in the form of like paint and pigment was only able to be found through our natural objects. So, you know, some part of the world before trade existed might have had a really rich source of, you know, a blue value or a, a blue hue, um, whereas another part might not have had that. And then, you know, that same part that had the blue maybe didn't have access to like a bright, vibrant red. So a lot of their artwork will be primarily blue based on just what was naturally growing and occurring in their area. Um, but then as, as time goes on and we start to see, you know, more trade happening and more interaction between the different parts of the world, the color starts to become more um, unified. And then in the 1900s and like late 1800s, we start to see synthetic pigment um, that doesn't have to come from like a natural source. So, you know, all of our color becomes more widely shared then. But then linking back up to this first bullet here, uh, how it can affect us directly um, and modify our thoughts, moods, actions, or even our health. Um, I've got a little diagram here about how certain colors make us feel and how different brands use those to their advantage. So there's lots of ones that we can go through here. The two I want to focus on, though, are the excitement and the optimism ones that we get from yellows and reds. And if you can think, there's something in the world that uses those colors in their branding almost always, and that is fast food restaurants. Um, I've got an example here of all of the ones that I have found that are not all of them, but just some of the ones that I've found that use one or both of those colors in their advertising. And that's because the red gives us a sense of excitement and um, youthfulness and boldness. And then the yellow gives us an optimism, a clarity and a warmth to us. And it can also um, evoke a feeling of hunger as well. So that excitement makes our like, you know, cells and our, you know, organs and everything start moving faster and working faster, which can make us hungry. Um, and so, you know, when you're going home at night and you see the big McDonald's arches ahead of you, you know, two miles or whatever, because it's so, you know, big in the sky, then, you know, by the time you get there, you might have convinced yourself like, oh, I should just pop in here real quick and get some dinner or get some fries or, you know, whatever, because your mind doesn't take that long to start reacting to those colors and, you know, creating a change or a sense of change. But there are certain fast food restaurants that don't use these colors, but most, if not, you know, they, most of them use at least one of these colors. There's not a, a lot that I can think of. Um, maybe like Popeye's um, that uses like the orange colors and then, you know, even Taco Bell, which is like primarily purple being used, but has a little touch of yellow in there as well. Um, but yeah, just, just think about that the next time you're, you're looking at these, these logos. Okay. Our color theory. This is a really, really important one here to remember. Um, and we also have our, our lesson five discussion on this as well. So our color wheel here is made in a very particular order. Um, it's not just randomly throwing the colors in there, just wherever they, they will fit at. Um, but our, our uh, color wheel that we know, like our just RGB color, or our um, red, red our primary color wheel, there we go, that's what I'm trying to say, is um, consists of 12 colors, 12 little wedges. 
We've got three primary colors, which are our red, blue, and yellow. We've got our secondary colors, which are our violet, orange, and green. And those two are about as far away from one another as they possibly can be. So when you put your reds and your blues and your yellows, your primary colors down first, they almost make like a triangle. Like they're so far away from one another on the color wheel. And then the primary or the secondaries are obviously in between those colors. So they create in their own triangle, like upside down. And then our tertiary colors, which those are the ones that are in between the secondaries and the primaries. But some important things to know about these specific colors. Primary colors are pure hues um, from which all colors can be mixed and, um, and that cannot be created by mixing other hues together. So red, yellow, and blue, those make up all of our other colors. Like they, we cannot have the rest of the color wheel if we don't have red, blue, and yellow because they have to mix all of the other colors that are here. Our secondary colors are hues produced by combining two primary colors. And those, as we know, are orange, green, and violet. So here's some terminology when we're referring to color theory. We have hues, which are just like the colors. And a pure hue means that there is no black or white being added into the color. It's like a pure hue. Um, saturation is how intensity or how intense or pure the color is. So if something is a pure hue, it's very high saturation. Everything on the color wheel that we see here that is a pure hue, there is no white or black being added to any of these colors here are fully saturated colors. They have no like tint or shade to them. They are just a pure saturated color. Tint is when a color is um, made lighter than its normal hue by adding white into it. And then a shade is when a color is darker than its normal, normal hue and black has been added to it. Um, and then lastly, we have color schemes or how a color can be organized based on the relationships to the color field. So analogous color schemes, that's when colors sharing a common hue next to each other on the color wheel are being used in a composition. So we see here the peppers are red and yellow and orange and like different kind of variations of those. And this is an analogous color scheme because the, they're, we're using only a section of the color wheel. You could also call this like a warm color scheme as well because we're only using the warm half of the color wheel. Complementary color schemes are when hues directly opposite each other on the color wheel are used to provide um, really intense contrast. So we have three sets of these, of the complementary colors. We've got red and green, blue and orange, and then purple and yellow. And those are really, really great co color combinations to sort of like help bring out, you know, the biggest parts of, you know, the composition um, and to draw attention and draw focus to them. Um, I'm going to use my my little background that I have here again to show an example of a complementary color scheme. The blue in the background there is contrasting with the orange sun, and it makes that orange sun just really, really pop out at you. And then, um, yeah, so those two that, that you have to understand how the color wheel is set up to understand what your complementary colors are. It won't make sense to you otherwise. And to even over to over explain this even more. Um, so when you have colors that are when you combine our primary colors all together, they neutralize one another and like they just you you're putting all the colors into one place. And so there's no way that any of them can like really stand out um, and they neutralize together. So our complementary colors exist because we have used all of the colors in the color wheel. So we have red here, for example, and then blue and yellow combined are green. And then when we combined green and red, they neutralize one another. So they're almost like an opposites attract sort of thing where we have, when they're next to one another, they really, really pop out and contrast well. But when they're mixed together, like if you're painting, they neutralize each other and like cancel out all of the color that could pop through. Complementary color schemes are used a lot in movies, especially like very like high, you know, budget cinematic blockbuster movies like Transformers and the Marvel movies and all of that. Next time that you're looking at one of those movies or watching one of those movies, just kind of notice, you know, there's like a lot of blue tints. Um, there might be like, you know, 
a choice of hair or other parts of like the movie, like cars here and transformers that, you know, the, the color in the background is used to make the point of emphasis, you know, even more contrasted. Monochromatic is using a single color and it's tints and shades. So um, not only just like blue, but you can also like add, you know, black into blue and white into blue to make different variations of it. But it's just using one color on the color wheel. And sometimes monochromatic color schemes are used intentionally, like with um, Picasso's Blue Period. We see um, that there was, you know, blue was the primary color being used because he wanted to convey a mood rather than um, he wanted to convey a mood within his pieces. He wanted to be seen very kind of like dark and depressed and moody. Um, and so that's why he stuck with like the one color throughout. Local color, this is the body color um, of the given object. So it's just like the natural color that it is. Whereas observed color is the perception of local color as it changes when light shifts on an object. So for example, this building here, if we were like just to take a photograph of it, would probably appear to be like kind of sort of like a beigey color or, you know, sort of tan. But because the light has affected it, we see that there is like this yellow, orangey color at the top here and more sort of like purples and blues at the bottom. And that's examples of observed color where it's not the local color, it's not the natural color that this, pieces, but it's the color that has been affected through the light. Intuitive color, um, this is the expressive use of color where it's not matching the, like, it's not based on anything natural, really. So like in this piece here, we see that there's like this green and like blue that's being used for the skin tones, which obviously is not the actual color that it is. Um, Fauvism, which is a movement that we'll get into in our art history unit, but this group of artists, um, they were a group that uh, of artists in the early 20th century. The artists embraced painterly qualities and bold use of color. Um, and th they were ones to use intuitive color. They didn't, they were kind of like going against the norm, going against what we traditionally thought about as being good artwork. All righty, our last element that we're gonna talk about is texture. Um, texture is the tactile qualities of surfaces or visual representations of those qualities. Texture can be experienced through touching or visual suggestions. Actual textures can be felt. There's things that exist like in sculpture, um, but sometimes they can be in paintings too. Actual textures can be felt and as used by sculptures and architects and simulated or implied textures are created to look like something other than paint. We can see here with this example that I've got that the it's an actual texture that's being used, but this piece is really made popular and like important because the texture changes from what it naturally is. If this was just like a porcelain cup, it wouldn't have much significance to it. It'd just be like, you know, what it normally was. But because the texture has changed here, the whole meaning of the work changes. The whole content's been affected because of the form. In plaid textures, like in Starry Night, um, we see that there's this rich tactile surface um, used as an expressive device. There's also thick brushworks of paint and textural rhythms happening. Um, and with this painting and with Van Gogh's painting, a lot of the times you can even see the paint that is there. It's not like smoothed out and blended in and everything, but you can actually see the marks that are being made here. Um, but it also, this, this tactile quality um, of texture that's implied here gives this piece a sense of motion and a sense of like, it, it makes it feel more realistic or like more, more, um, special, I guess. I don't know what else, what other words to use to describe it, but it it's much more impactful than if this was just like a smoothed out piece that didn't have that painterly quality about it that, you know, is achieved through the texture. All righty. So um, that was it for lesson five. So that summarizes, let's go share my screen. That summarizes the, um, all the lessons in module two, lessons three through five, and also summarizes our elements of art as well. So um, I hope that, that all, you know, made good sense to you. Um, and I'm excited for us to go into our next lessons that will talk about the principles of design, um, which are our recipes for artwork or making artwork. Um, but I will see you guys next time. And um, I hope you enjoyed it.